It's the Mike Francesa Podcast on the Bet Rivers Network. Hello again, everybody, and welcome to the Mike Francesa Podcast brought to you by the folks at Bet Rivers. Remember, go to the Bet Rivers app, download it. It's all you'll need for any of your gaming situations. And remember, you get a faster experience, exclusive promotions, one app while traveling, and you get a chance for all their extra value, including a chance uh, to win $10,000 by playing the Bet River Square game, where with a $10 bet on a same game parlay, you can win up to $10,000. Um, this is a little different podcast in that it's uh, about the passing of Bob Knight. I uh, made a trip today, got home. Uh, around dinner time, I had taken uh, my youngest son uh, to co- to look at a college and got home and I started getting texts that said Bob Knight had died. I'm not sure the last time I thought about Bob Knight. I was trying to remember the status of our relationship and I can't even remember that, to be honest with you. I don't know uh, if he's if he wasn't talking to me. I think that was the case. Um uh, in the last couple of years, he was angry at me a couple of times, uh, hung up on me on the fan because he didn't like a question I asked. Um, and uh, I don't know exactly as he kind of faded into old age. He had been very ill. There had been talk of him uh, having some dementia. Um, and I don't even I can't even tell you folks as I sit here and remember his uh, brilliant career and his uh, amazing life uh, exactly the last time I talked to him. I'm not even sure. Um, It's going to be a double-edged sword when people uh, remember Bob Knight. They're going to tell you the amazing things he did and all the respect they had for him as a basketball coach, which is overwhelming. I mean, whether you liked him, detested him, got along with him, didn't get along with him, like a lot of us got along with him at times, didn't get along with him at other times, um, there was no questioning that this was not only one of the great coaches in the history of American sport, this was a man who had an incredible impact on his game, incredible impact. You know, we will not see the likes of Bob Knight again. There is no room in sports, in big time sports, college level, professional level for Bob Knights anymore. Some people will call that a good thing. Did Bob Knight do some outrageous things? Yes. Did Bob Knight do some unreasonable things? Yes. Was Bob Knight over the top at times? Yes. Was he a bully at times? Yes. But he was also a man of an unwavering principle who stood by those principles all the time. And someone who had an incredible impact, not only on a lot of people's lives, but also on the game that he probably understood on a level that very few could ever grasp. Um, I got to be around Bob Knight. I got to go to his practices, which were usually close to virtually everybody, and go to those practices and observe and learn. Um, they were amazing things to see. They weren't always pretty. But then afterwards, you might be driving with them somewhere or going to dinner with them at one of these, you know, wacky places. And he went to some strange places to eat. I can tell you that because I went with him a couple of times. Um, and he would talk about things about basketball and you would just sit there and say, uh, you know, that you were in the presence of someone who had a grasp for the game that was 
unequaled. That was uh, amazing. You know, I can remember there was this one time and people have had uh, have, have heard that at times I have had a frothy relationship with Coach Parcells in recent years. We've had our, our disagreements. Um, but there was a couple of times where we went to Bloomington in the off season and spent a couple of days with Coach Knight. And those were extremely memorable days. They really were. They were different, but they were a lot of fun. They were, they were days that I uh, cherish when I go back and think about them. And I can remember, you know, sitting, I can remember him driving me and him talking about putting together the Olympic team. And, you know, what he expected from this player and what went on with Charles Barkley and what he expected from Jordan and what he got from this guy and this and this and this and the pressure he felt and this and that. Um, just to have the questions answered that I always thought about or things that came to mind that I brought up. You know, some things are very memorable. Like I, I can remember we were talking once about coaches and he said something to me that I've never forgotten. And I don't know that I've ever repeated maybe i have i don't even remember but he said to me that he said nobody that i've ever observed or known understands what it means to be a coach more than bill parcells which is about as high a compliment as you can be paid who he called Walter. It's a long story, but he called Walter. Um, but um, everyone knows about their relationship dating back to those days at Army. Everyone knows about his relationship with uh, Mike Krzyzewski that night, who, despite their problems, and they had many, and their relationship didn't end up, I'm sure, the way either one wanted it to end up which was painful for both because there was a lot of pride involved and a lot of things involved. And the bottom line is here was this legendary coach as good a coach as we have ever seen who helped mentor and helped bring uh, along a guy who was either his equal or maybe even had topped him with what he accomplished in the modern game, in Coach K. And a lot of that was hard for Coach K to deal with. A lot of it was hard for Bob Knight to deal with. But when you have a day like this, where you want to put him in some perspective, you look and you say to yourself, yeah, there was a lot of things he shouldn't have done and things that were really tough to take. No one can dispute that. Nobody can argue that. But the good that he brought to the sport, the good that he brought to the game, the impact he had on the game was so much more valuable than that. I would put it as simply as this. Did he have faults? Absolutely. Who doesn't? Did he have glaring weaknesses? Yes. But at his best, I think he was the, simply put, the greatest basketball coach who has ever lived. I don't think he accomplished more than Mike. I think Mike accomplished more than he did. I think Mike's longevity and Mike's level of success over a period of time and how he acclimated himself to the more modern game and related to the player and everything else took Mike past him in terms of what's been accomplished. But I don't think there ever was a coach, despite all the weaknesses and despite also the fact that he was completely unwavering in how he wanted to play the game and 
the principles he brought to the game. I mean, he demanded things from his players. He not only expected them to go to class and to work hard and to study, he expected them to act like good young men. He expected them when they were given something by an alumni in terms of a meal or an act of kindness, he expected them to respond the right way, to show gratitude, to act the way you would want young men to act. And he demanded that of his players, which became very old fashioned. And probably in a lot of ways, something that the players no longer would, would stand for. He wasn't going to change the way he coached. He wasn't going to change the way he wanted to present the game and coach the game. He had a belief in the way the game should be played. And he showed that when done right, when done right, he can take it, he could take it to the highest of levels. And that all came together with that 76 team. That is the last undefeated championship team in college basketball. John Wooden won more championships. John Wooden had better players in the likes of Kareem, Bill Walton, et cetera, et cetera, and so on. But John Wooden also looked the other way while a man named Sam Gilbert clearly broke rules with his players something he had to be aware of. There's no way he couldn't have been aware, aware of that. That irked guys like Knight. It just had to because that was who he was. But you look back, and if you want to understand him, and you don't because he's been gone too long or you just don't understand the impact he had, then go watch the documentary on the 76 team. You know, he always talked about how the team the year before, when Scott May broke his wrist, his hand and his wrist, that whole injury he had there, that kept them from winning a championship, was the better of the two teams. He was, you know, adamant about that. And no one would argue it. And he talked about how it still bothered him to this day that he broke up he broke up the greatest defensive backcourt he felt ever created in college basketball and Quim Buckner and, and Wilkinson. And then lost the game by allowing Kentucky to score upwards of 90 points on that great Indiana team in that, in that regional game they lost. That bothered him to this day. He considered it a colossal mistake and one he beat himself up for. No one else would because there was an injury involved and he had to make a move, but it still bothered him that he made that move all these years later. But he was unwavering in how he drove a team to perfection. A lot of people would find that intolerable. Why did he want to win all these games by all these points? Because he was playing not against victory, not against the schedule. He was playing against his ability to impose his will and his system on perfection and how close he could come to having his team over the period of a season play the game to a level that no one else could attain. That's what he was chasing. And he found it in that year. Just look at the championship game against a tough Michigan team. And in those games, teams that know you well, Teams that come from your league, as Georgetown learned against Villanova years later in a championship game, those teams are the toughest teams to beat because they have no fear 
of you. They don't know you. If you play a team for the first time in that NCAA tournament and you play a Georgetown or you play in Indiana, they're going to destroy you because you just don't have any idea how to play them. But when you have an, a team that knows how to match up, like Villanova did against Georgetown or Michigan did against Indiana, it makes the game that much tougher. But then with so much on the line, look at the second half they played. Maybe as perfect an offensive half as any team has ever played in a championship setting in college basketball. These are all part of the legacy he left. He won championships. He won three of them. Later years, he didn't find the same level of success because he couldn't find the same level of players. Because the game... The way he wanted to coach it, the way the culture had changed, it no longer demanded things from youngsters. So the youngsters no longer would give it to him if he demanded it. And that's why he didn't get the same level of player and couldn't make the same level of demands. He would have had to adapt and that wasn't who he was. Adapting wasn't part of his game because he believed in certain ways of playing and he was going to play the game that way. And his teams at their best were going to play that game that way. So a lot of guys who were had a strained relationship from him will now hopefully remember the good days. And things that came later on will be overlooked at this moment when you take what he brought to his sport and the contributions he made and the impacts that he had. He was a giant in his game. He was an incredibly impactful coach. And like I said, I think on his best day, the best coach that the sport has ever seen. You can't compare football coaches to basketball coaches. You can't compare what someone does in baseball to what they do in basketball. So you have to take it just basketball, college basketball. And on that level, I firmly believe that on his best day, with him taking it to the level that he could demand from his team, he was the greatest college basketball coach of all time. I firmly believe that. And that's what I'll remember. You know, it's funny. He could be utterly charming and just shake your head crazy in the same night. He could be, you know, he could do something really nice for somebody and then fly off the handle in an outrageous way. That was just who he was. I don't, I don't try to explain that. I don't know if anybody could explain that. I sure can't. I'm sure people who were closer to him than I was can't explain that. But to me, I consider it great fortune in my career that I got the chance to be close to to a coach like that. And like I said, we had our falling outs, we had our arguments, we had our fights, he got mad at me, he hung up on me. I mean, we listen, we all go through that. That's the bottom line. That's part of the relationships with him. But you know what? I'll remember those days and those conversations because I have an appreciation of the sport and I have an appreciation of the game. And I was around someone who did it, I think, better than anybody else. So today, you put aside all the bad things and all the things that will all be brought up and they are part of his legacy, just like everything else. But when you look at what he accomplished and you look 
at what he and how he tried to raise the game by the way he coached it. He was extremely rare and extremely special. And for as long as they bounce a basketball, not just in Indiana, where they love basketball, not just in college basketball, but wherever they bounce a ball in this world, they will remember and, I think, revere the name Bob Knight. He's earned that. He deserved that. He was that special, and in the greatest scheme of things, I think the good outweighed the bad. Because at its zenith, on those special days, in those special seasons, it was that rare and that good. And like we saw, sometimes perfect. Bob Knight gone at the age of 83. May you rest in peace. Thanks for listening to the Mike Francesa podcast on the Bet Rivers Network. 